Welcome and thank you for attending tonight's forum. I'm gonna agree that I'm being recorded here. Sorry, it was in my screen. Um, tonight's forum for Congressional District 37, candidates hosted by the Culver City Democratic Club. Uh, my name is Judith martin Straw. I'm the publisher and editor at culvercitycrossroads.com and I will be moderating the forum tonight. First, each candidate will have three minutes for an introduction and an opening statement. Um, We'll proceed with questions submitted by members of the Culver City Democratic Club. We'll have seven policy rounds uh, where each candidate will have two minutes to respond and then four more personal questions with one minute answers. Finally, each candidate gets three minutes for a closing statement. So Jeff will be waving his phone to uh, demarcate those points in time as to where we have crossed the meridian there. So uh, club members will vote for endorsements online following the March 9th general meeting with results announced by the 12th. So not be um, actually frosting the cake tonight. We're gonna just collect our information and it will all go uh, on to the next. And uh, I'm sure that will also be uh, published in Culver City Crossroads when those announcements come out. So um, our candidates will introduce themselves with their opening statements. Thank you very much to each of you for uh, agreeing to participate and attending. Uh, it was very kind of you to accept your uh, invitation. So we have um, Culver City Mayor, uh, Dr. Daniel Lee, former LA Council Member, Jan Perry, and current State Senator, Sydney Kamlager. And uh, we will start with um, Ms. Kamlager. Give us, your, give us your opening statement, please. Make some sort of sound so we can tell, yeah. Not yet. Okay. It oh, now we hear me, you, now we hear yeah, you. Yeah, it wouldn't Wait, let yes. me unmute. The foibles of technology. You're good, okay. you're on. Yes, we're good. Let it roll, yes, okay. thank you. Great. Well, good evening, Culver City. My name is Sydney Kamlager, and I'm the Senator for the 30th State Senate District and a candidate for the 37th. Some of you may know my story. I'm a girl from Chicago who got my first taste of politics, helping my grandmother work to get Harold Washington elected as the first Black mayor of Chicago. I then came out here to go to college and spend time with my dad. It was the earthquake in 93 that actually sent me back to the East Coast, but it was the riots during that time that brought me back and instilled in me a desire to be part of this city and its fabric and its work towards healing. I spent a number of years in the nonprofit art world. I was on the board of the Southern California Library for Social Studies and Research, a little communist library in South LA. I worked at the LA Festival, the Spark, and the Center for the Study of Political Graphics, funding projects that hired local artists that are rarely seen or valued, connecting commuters to communities, and elevating stories of complexity, resiliency, and protest through art. I then worked at Crystal Stairs, fighting against our budget cuts, organizing our parents and providers, and helping families find and pay for childcare so that they could go to work or go to school and not have to worry about making ends meet. All of this happened before I decided to work in government and ultimately for you. I was a campaign manager for Supervisor Holly J. Mitchell and served as her district director in both the Assembly and the Senate, where I supported her on major legislation, connected constituents and stakeholders to government and to solutions, and ultimately met many of you. It was then that I ran for the Los Angeles Community College Board. And while I was on the board, I diversified our many vendor pools. I supported labor through many of our contract negotiations. And I stood up for our students and our faculty during the Trump and ICE madness. Then I ran for the assembly and the Senate where I have been here in the legislature, leaning into a platform focused on bringing people from the margins to the center. I'm incredibly excited about my legislative package. I was able to get signed into passed into law, the Crisis Act. We worked on transformative probation reform, the first of its kind in the country. 
I reformed a number of gang enhancements. I brought thousands of jobs to South LA. We made charging stations more enticing for cities to want to put in. We invested in public health systems across the state with $300 million plus going to many of them. I brought urban farming to my district and I got $4 million in funding for traditional transitional housing and the shelter project right here in Denver City. I am running for this seat to make a difference in people's lives. And I can fight for more people as a voice in Congress. Bad policy is spreading like a cancer across our state and the cure is national policy. Our democracy is fragile here and abroad and time is up. We will talk more, thank you. Thank you, Sydney. Uh, our next uh, opening statement is from uh, Mayor Dr. Daniel Lee. Uh, thank you for that, Judith, and uh, thank you all for having me. I want to start out with uh, a few things that I think might come up in the personal questions category. Uh, one of the things that I've heard for quite some time is, why not stay in Culver City? We've been able to do some good work, and I do not take sole credit for that work. I know it's really based on the type of colleagues that I've had, and that's an ideal situation. Uh, but I'd like to remind people that prior to being on the council, I was on the Culver City MLK Celebration Committee for over a decade. Uh, and as a council member, my four year limit, myself and council member Fish will be in April. Uh, so when we are actually termed out, it will be four and a half years. So I've been serving Culver City for 15 years. Uh, solid uh, more than most of the people who I am running against and most of our recent council members. Um, I think Culver City is a great city uh, and I have appreciated living here. It's I've lived here longer than I've lived anywhere else, but I think sometimes you need to move on and do other things. I uh, just wanted to give that con context. The other thing that I've heard a lot is why Congress? If you've interacted with me at all here in Culver City or regionally, you know that a large motivator for me is the climate crisis. Uh, part of the reason that I was elected was our push to close down the Inglewood oil field. I had been volunteering with Sierra Club, Food and Water Watch and other groups for eight to 10 years prior to being elected uh, for that purpose. I'm happy that we took the vote to close it down. Uh, but we need to make sure that the process um, conforms to what that vote actually did, which is sometimes in question. One of the reasons I'm supporting Freddie Puza and his uh, and his effort to join the Culver City Council, because I think he can make sure that we complete that work. But on the federal level, we're not doing enough. We're saying a lot. We're, you know, taking pictures at various places like uh, solar farms and the like, but we're not passing policy that actually addresses the climate crisis. And no matter what type of policy is your own personal priority, not addressing the climate crisis will make it worse. It's one of the reasons that I got into politics at all, and it is the reason that I'm running for Congress. I would appreciate your support, but I'm looking forward to the questions coming up. And you know I will answer everything completely transparently and honestly. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. So I'm sorry, I want to bring up just a little tiny point of protocol. Uh, Ms. Perry, I, I kind of know more about Sydney and Daniel because they're more of my, I do local news and you have not had a lot of traffic through Culver City. So can I address you as Jan or would you prefer Ms. Perry? I don't want to be disrespectful, no, but I don't want to put you on a different level than everyone else either. So what's what's comfortable for you? Uh, well, let's see. I'm a former councilwoman, Jan Perry. You can call me Jan. Uh, and I, I do traffic. I traffic through Culver City every day. So thank you. And uh, that, that's yeah, fine. I just wanted to make sure we were all yeah. on, a, on, on, the yeah, same, no, no. Uh, on the same page there. Thank you so fine. much. So uh, Jeff, once you, now you start your timer. Okay, wait, wait, wait before, are, where do you going to wave at me when my time's up or what should I do? Yeah, uh, Jeff has his uh, timer in the screen. So okay. if you see where Jeff is there, you'll actually okay. get a timer. Or if you want, we can also cue you. What's what's most comfortable? Yeah, just cue me. Just cue okay. me. I don't have to think about it. We'll give you a 10 so, second call. 
All right, I'm ready to go. So uh, good evening, right there? Yeah. yeah. Okay, good evening, everybody. And I'm very pleased to be here. My name is Jan Perry and I am a candidate for the 37th Congressional District. And uh, you know, political campaigns are rough, rough and tumble. They are a campaign, they are a competition. People say things, they, they try to say things to push other people out of the way. But I'm a firm believer that everyone has a right to run, no matter how old they are. And so let me just address that up front. I have a lot of experience. I was a councilwoman back in the day, 2001 to 2013, and we had term limits. But in my time, and I used my time very well, I shepherded through 6,000 units of affordable housing before HHH with new market tax credits and tax increment financing. 1,300 of those units were for people who were homeless and had mental health challenges. But I didn't just leave that. I represented Skid Row for 12 years. And when I represented Skid Row, it didn't look like it does now. Why? Because we had teams and we went out every single week for several years and went directly to the tents, directly to the encampments, took people out of there and put them in a bed or in housing. And in some cases, when someone's health was at risk, I actually took that person against their will to save their life. That is how deep and committed and how much experience I have doing this. I also represented downtown and South LA. Every project that I ever built had a project labor agreement and a community benefits agreement so that we could reach into left behind communities and in zip codes where people had never had the chance to compete, to get a good paying job with, with good benefits in these large projects that were subsidized by taxpayer funds. Because of that, I was able to put 90,000 people back to work over the course of 12 years in good paying jobs and connect those projects with our community-based organizations, not only in South Los Angeles, but Pico Union, East LA, and North of there. And to this day, many of those people are still working there. I'm a single mother, a mother of a millennial, and I'm proud of her because she works very, very hard. I'm in a situation like a lot of people were or, or are. Having a millennial who's working hard, she has three jobs, hardly any benefits, and you know, is, like most millennials, is having a very rough time. And until very recently, the end of 2019, I was also caring for an aging parent who had dementia. So I understand the struggles of everyday people. And I want to take my lived experience to Washington, DC, not to be part of a club, not to be part of a political machine or to be anointed, but to be elected and to sent, sent to carry an agenda for all of you. Yeah, thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much. So um, great, thank you. Very strong opening statement. So we really appreciate your candor. People bringing in a lot of details, bringing in a lot of background. So we're gonna jump into the present moment. We said we have uh, seven policy questions and we're gonna start with question number one, I'm going to uh, Daniel. Uh, if elected, what are your top three priorities? How would you achieve them? And candidates, I am actually going to hold you to top three priorities. I know there's a temptation to bring in those top five priorities, those top 10 priorities, but let's just keep it to three and we'll give everybody uh, uh, their airtime. So, um, uh, Mr. Mayor, if you would like to start. Uh, thank you for that. I have 27, but uh, <laughs> my, my top three priorities are uh, really a more aggressive response to the climate crisis via legislation like the Green New Deal and ending fossil fuel subsidies and providing, uh, you know, government funds to transition workers who work in the fossil fuel industry or dirty fuel industries uh, into clean energy jobs. One of the reasons people don't want to do that as much is because those jobs are non-union. They don't have benefits and they don't have the same capacity uh, to take care of their family. Secondarily, I think we really need to work to codify a woman or a person's right to choose in legislation uh, instead of relying on the Supreme Court. It's something that's sort of a hot potato anytime the presidency changes and one of our aged Supreme Court justices either chooses to retire or die. Uh, we need to say affirmatively that, that we believe in equal rights. I know a lot of this has been framed as about abortion and about reproductive justice, which it is, but fundamentally there is a belief that women are lesser and don't have the capacity to make their own decisions. I disagree. Uh, 
Third, I feel we need to work towards comprehensive immigration reform that includes both a path to citizenship and a robust guest worker program. A path to citizenship for people like, but not limited to uh, the DACA kids and their parents uh, who've been advocating for themselves for quite some time over a decade, but also a guest worker program like many countries have around the world where people can come to our country for a job for a season and then go back home and share the fruits of their labor with their family. It's something that happens around the world. It's something that makes a lot of sense. And the only reason that it doesn't happen here in the United States is racism. Thank you. Uh, our next uh, top three priorities will be uh, uh, Jan. Okay, thank you. And I have a minute, right? Uh, two. Two minutes, okay, so I don't have to rush. Yeah, okay. Thank you. So, thank you. Um, my top three priorities uh, will be affordable housing, uh, economic and wellness recovery from the impacts of COVID and upskilling workers uh, for uh, clean energy jobs in response to the climate crisis, number one, you know, we can build more affordable housing. I know that because I actually did it without, you know, subsidies uh, from the taxpayers. But what we need to do is to dig deeper on where to situate this housing so that people don't oppose it. We can remove restrict, we can remove easements and restrictive easements from large shopping areas because retail's face has been changed forever by COVID. It will never be the same. I live near the Ladera shopping center there's certainly opportunity to take some of that available land because it's never fully parked anymore. I think about other shopping centers like Del Amo and those large ones where we could take that land that is already assembled and create communities on that surface uh, to the betterment of the community. Now, COVID recovery, wellness recovery, children have had to engage in remote learning. It has had an impact not only on the children because of the deprivation of their social opportunities, but their parents uh, in terms of childcare issues and having to work for home, from home, a lot of stress all around. The federal government can uh, use the model uh, of federally qualified health centers uh, to bring federal funds deeper into people's communities. I know this can be done. I opened up a no number of health clinics in high schools in South Los Angeles, not only for the students on campus, but also outward facing so that their families could come in too embedded in a school because the schools are embedded in our neighborhoods, made it more convenient for everybody. And then the last point I wanna bring in is, I'm the director of two nonprofits right now. One deals with homelessness and the other one deals with infrastructure. We're bringing forth a project uh, in a city uh, uh, of Long Beach that will be a clean energy project. Uh, and we'll- Yeah, that's gonna be your time. Thank you. Thank you. And wrapping it up with Ms. Sydney, top three. Top three, economic health, mental health, and climate health, economic health. Poverty has increased uh, in 2020 for the first time in a while. And nationally, there are 38 million people living in poverty. Most of them are children. You know, we have an opportunity to have a national paid family leave. We have an opportunity to uh, connect uh, federal uh, regulations to state law so that we can make that low-income families have greater access to federal uh, tax credits and to make sure that we do not have to subsidize poverty in a way that keeps people poor. Mental health. Uh, we need to destigmatize this issue and properly fund it. We have seen an uptick in suicides of our teens and an uptick in anxiety and depression across the nation. We need to fund behavioral health. We need to fund more professionals and paraprofessionals into the system. We need to make sure that we are more deeply investing in system infrastructure that is equitable and accessible to everyone. And we also need to make sure that we are having more beds that are available to those who are mentally challenged. And last, climate health. If we don't have a planet that is healthy, none of that other stuff will matter. You know, here in California, uh, in 2017, we were the fourth largest producer of crude oil. And that's not West Virginia or any of the other places uh, where we've been fighting against climate change and trying to help people understand that data is real and that climate change is real. So we should be doing our part to go back to the Obama climate uh, 
change plan of 2030 and accelerating those numbers of making sure that we are dealing with climate resiliency and adaptation of making sure that we have our grid that is resilient across the country and making sure that we are weaning off our addiction to oil and to plastic and consumption. Thank you. And that's time. Thank you. So uh, a lot of agreement there on uh, what our big issues are. So that's great to know that people have, uh, have their page together. Um, our second policy question, uh, what are your most important accomplishments so far as an elected official or as an activist? We're not gonna hold you to time in office. We're gonna give you the whole, the full, the full CV here. So um, we're gonna start with um, uh, Jan. Mm -hmm. What are your most important accomplishments so far, elected or activist? So one of my most important accomplishments is uh, I built my own continuum of care before it was a thing. Um, I recognized early on representing Skid Row that I had to be able to provide a place for people to go, people who were subject to 72-hour psychiatric lockups or 5150s. So I assembled funding year-round for the largest homeless shelter in the city of Los Angeles, but I situated it in such a way that it is discreetly located and has no impact on anybody's community. It has 650 beds, a section for men and a section for women, and then I enriched it with services. And we did a bus loop twice a day through Skid Row to take anyone who uh, wanted to get a bed and wanted to get help. That was one. And then two, simultaneously working with nonprofit housing developers to find out exactly what they needed to do to assemble land, to get discretionary approvals, to get that housing up as quickly as possible. And one of my proudest achievements is working with uh, Skid Row Housing Trust to put a building up uh, over hundred units for permanent supportive housing with modular construction. Again, before it was even uh, an issue or a, a thing, um, when we did it in record time, two years, most projects take five years. And then I guess I could say, my contribution to cooling down South Los Angeles was the construction of two man-made wetlands, one at Slauson and Compton and one at 54th and Avalon, not only to cool the area down, to deal with the aged infrastructure, to deal with urban runoff and to bring nature back to South Los Angeles so that families in South LA could enjoy what everyone else enjoys across the city. Great, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, so your most important accomplishments as an elected or as an activist, Ms. Sydney. Thank you. Well, I will say uh, there are quite a few, yeah, that I'm happy of. One, getting AB 118, the Crisis Act, passed and signed into law, and then learning that it was actually incorporated into Congresswoman Karen Bass's George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. This would uh, fund community-based organizations to respond to 911 calls so that law enforcement doesn't have to. This is also turned into having a national 988 hotline, and I'm proud that my bill was the impetus for that. AB 333, uh, getting rid of some gang enhancements and inserting due process back into our criminal legal system. I fought so many rounds with the DA's office, the DA's association to get this happen, to get this across the finish line, and it did with just the bare number of votes. Finding $300 million in our budget to fund public health departments across the state and finding $60 million to go to Kedron, which will now be able to build a hospital in South LA that serves some of the poorest in my district and in South LA. Um, Probation reform, a transformative probation reform bill that was actually the first of its kind in the nation. And there are other pilot ideas out there across the states. Uh, standing up as a proud board member, joining Planned Parenthood and finding, standing up for a woman's right to choose, um, being uh, proud to support um, a legislation that will codify LA County as being a safe haven for abortion access and working to put 50 well being centers on uh, high schools throughout LA. Unified, co-founding the Black Women's Democratic Club so that we can bring Black women who are the heart of the Democratic Party front and center and working to build a pipeline for young Black women who want to be engaged in politics, bringing 4,500 jobs my first year in the assembly to South LA, but ultimately doing all this while raising school-aged children. 
And we're going to call you there. Excellent to see. It's good we didn't hold you to your top three accomplishments as an elected or an activist. We would have we would have really really uh, stifled the flow here. Uh, Daniel, your top accomplishments, elected or activist? Uh, thank you for that, Judith. I think uh, we've been able to accomplish quite a bit in Culver City since I've been elected. But the things that I'm most proud of are one, our mobile crisis response pilot program, which uh, was moving forward prior to the passage of the Crisis Act and was funded in the Culver City budget. Uh, I met with our police chief and our fire chief uh, just a month after I was elected prior to the uprisings in 2020. And I told them that I wanted to bring social workers both into the police and fire department. Once the uprising happened, I was able to change the context of the conversation. Uh, I'm happy that some colleagues came along in the prior council and then further in this council, uh, despite some administrative back and forth, which I did appreciate. Uh, but I also am very proud that we about rent control to Culver City for the first time in our city's history. Um, Culver City was founded as a sundown town and rent control uh, sort of sort of helps us address that legacy of exclusion uh, based on redlining and other practices. Also, of course, closing voted to close down the Inglewood oil field. I credit that as a huge reason why I was elected at all. Uh, but I had put in a number of years of work prior to that. I said it was about eight years as a volunteer with the Sierra Club, uh, taking a leadership position uh, to try to make that happen. Uh, lastly, uh, though I could talk about some other things, uh, HDR 48, the We the People Amendment, which is currently in Congress with our current lead sponsor, Pramila Jayapal, it is an amendment to the Constitution around Citizens United and other cases. I authored that, uh, co-authored that bill in our nonprofit before we sent it to Congress. Excellent. Thank you all so much. Uh, the world is clearly a better place because you're all uh, uh, taking part in it. Uh, this is, uh, these, are some, these are some really notable accomplishments. Uh, I hope people are taking notes and noticing what, uh, what you prioritize and where you put your energy. Uh, question number three, we're still on our policy questions. Um, what will you do in Congress regarding the housing crisis? Uh, we're gonna start with uh, Sydney. Thank you. Well, you know, we are fortunate uh, that um, we have $195 billion flooding across this country through this infrastructure plan. So it's not that we don't have enough money. The issue is what are we going to do with it? Uh, that we have a crisis of affordability here in California and across the country. It is that rent is too damn high, and so is the mortgages and the first downs. And so I would work to make sure that we would allow folks who want to own homes to be able to buy them without having to go into debt. Uh, there's a first time homeowner project that we've been funding here that I would want to make sure we could bring to the national scale. Um, we also have to make sure that we are getting rid of things like SCA2, or making sure that we pass things like SCA2 so that we repeal a lot of these ordinances that are in our constitutions that are prohibiting us from building social housing. I think we have to not only repair the social and public housing that's currently in existence, but making sure that we are doubling down on investments for a reimagined kind of social housing. I think we need to be expanding our vouchers and we need to stop punishing the poor and folks who are working poor um, by not allowing them to have access to the kind of quality housing that they deserve. Ultimately, I think we need federal policy that um, will allow states the kind of authority and teeth that we need to uh, talk with our locals about making sure that they are building the kind of housing that is important for all of us. But ultimately, at the end of the day, housing is not going to happen without funding, and it's also not going to happen without changing some of the things and progress prop policies and processes that are happening within our financial and lending institutions that still in discriminatory ways redline and keep all for all sorts of folks out of communities and neighborhoods where they want to live and where they deserve to live. Thank you. All right, we're going to toss that question at uh, Daniel. Congress, housing, go. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, Jeff, 
can't see the numbers yeah, yet. You, you a little, that, you a, yeah, you need to hit a return there. Uh, but uh, generally, sorry, um, thank you. He's gonna, federal, hit, he's gonna start it over for you, Daniel. Thanks. Now yep. we're on take two. Thank you for that. Uh, so generally, I believe that we need to work towards the federal government, both funded and building housing itself. Of course, for that to happen in a place like California, we need to repeal Article 34 of the California Constitution. That's something that needs to happen at the state level uh, in order to build housing uh, in local neighborhoods without a referendum or a public referendum. Uh, I had the opportunity when I was at the National Conference of Mayors in DC in January to speak with uh, the Assistant Secretary at HUD and a number of other HUD representatives and that's uh, um, you know, the federal organization that's really involved with housing and housing production. And one of the things that I said was very similar to what I just said, the federal government needs to build housing, otherwise we will never be able to provide for people who are working class or at the low income level of the structure in terms of our housing crisis. They agreed, but they also intimated uh, in ways that they couldn't necessarily talk about, uh, about Build Back Better and some provisions and some versions of that bill uh, that actually provided funding for both social housing and low income housing. And while I am a passionate proponent for social housing, I also build, I also believe that we need to build low income housing that is high quality and that is kept up on a regular basis. Social housing to some degree, I think makes a lot of sense. It's mixed income. People don't have the same type of um, incorrect thoughts that they have, but poor people deserve to have nice things. Working class people deserve to have nice things. They should not be nice just because they are in proximity to middle class and upper class people. We need to build high quality housing that's funded by the government for working class people. Thank you. And finally, Jan, tell us about housing. So my focus at, at the federal level as a congresswoman will be on the construction and the funding and the strategic uh, coordination of federal agencies to encourage the growth of more affordable housing. I, I've witnessed firsthand market rate housing can take care of itself based on market forces. Um, a couple of ideas where I would take from the local level and take to Washington DC. Number one, a fully funded affordable housing trust fund with incentives so that people who build, people who develop can buy down the cost of units and to take this program to scale across the country so we can really and truly coordinate the efforts of housing and urban development, health and human services, and the Economic Development Administration. Then the establishment of a national standard for enhanced infrastructure financing districts. So you can build the infrastructure, put in the broadband, put in the decent street lighting and, and trees and, and sewage lines and all that. So you can create that platform to build affordable housing. So you create the incentives to go into an area that someone may not have previously considered and realize that, that possibility that yes, we can build mixed income communities, we can build affordable communities, and we can build low to moderate income communities that all look the same and are done with high quality materials and the highest standards of design. Um, I, I'm also thinking that at the federal level, we can go into those areas where in the past, maybe people made mistakes at the local level. I'm thinking of the, the expansion of the freeway in Pasadena and all those houses that uh, are, are being occupied by people. Uh, the federal government can find situations like that all over this country. I would look for those situations in the 37th district where projects have been abandoned. Manchester Square is a perfect example of that over by the area and repurpose those structures for a higher and better use. Okay, thank you. So our on to policy question number four, and this is one that um, um, is vital uh, to, to so many different conversations. Uh, we wanna talk about uh, reimagining the police. So uh, seeing as how the United States has the world's highest incarceration rate, uh, what is your public safety platform and we're going to start with a Daniel. 
Uh, thank you for that, Judith. My public safety platform really focuses on care, not cops. I have to admit um, very openly that I was disappointed in the state of the union last night uh, because a lot of what people have been talking about in the context of possibly defunding the police is really uh, reassigning certain duties to different people who possess expertise in those duties. Many of those people are social workers, psychologists, medical professionals who are more equipped to actually handle issues that relate to homelessness, that relate to mental health, that relate to other issues. Police organizations and people who are uh, police lobbyists or boosters have all agreed that we ask our law enforcement officers to do too much. Yet the response for asking them to do too much is just to train them to do more. I think that's wrong. I think that's fundamentally antithetical and it just doesn't make sense. Uh, we need to make sure that we have the actual support so that mental health professionals and professionals who deal with unhoused people and their disparate needs are empowered uh, to work with them prior to interactions with law enforcement. But additionally, uh, we need to work towards single payer health care. We need to work towards things like a homes guarantee. We need to work towards a broader and stronger social safety net that will make sure that our streets are not full of unhoused people, that our streets are full of people who are walking, biking, driving to places where they can interact with people who bring them joy and bring joy to the community. Uh, uh, focusing on law enforcement alone that's, that's is not the way to go and not something that I would support. So we're gonna, we're gonna call time on you, Daniel. Thank you so much. Um, our next uh, question goes to uh, Ms. Perry. Mm -hmm. uh, what is your public safety platform? Well, I have a number number of uh, issues that I care very much about, but I also want to just share a personal experience in working in Skid Row for 12 years, I witnessed firsthand specialized training and the benefits it can bring to not just police officers, but everyone in that continuum of care, including social workers, outreach workers, people who are formerly homeless, to be able to help people get off, into, off the street and into, into treatment. Um, I think we have a lot to learn from Scandinavian countries about the focus on rehabilitation. Um, you know, we're going through a transition right now here in our city where, you know, people feel like the house is on fire and we have to treat that too. But we also have to maintain our focus in the reforms that we have already begun. I am a workforce development, former general manager and executive, and I would like to see uh, a lift on the ban on Pell Grants for uh, incarcerated people so that we can prepare people for when they do go through, through re-entry uh, back into uh, a society or the city so that they have a skill, that they have uh, basic knowledge so that they can get out there and compete. And it may deter them from uh, recidivist activity uh, and give them a better chance uh, to fully be rehabilitated and to recover. I think that the Marijuana Opportunity and Expungement Act is another opportunity again to redirect a social justice agenda uh, by people who were adversely impacted by the war on drugs and bring some restoration about and create uh, new opportunities for funding streams and uh, for creating businesses. But again, you need the basis of that is a basic education. Everybody needs to be able to have that. Um, and then I guess I would speak just uh, from, from pure experience on uh, working with reentry organizations uh, at a level, I, I can fully realize the impact and the value of bringing people directly from imprisonment and incarceration into the building trades. We're, um, we're gonna have to call time on you. Okay. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Okay. All right, you know the question, it's your turn, Sydney, public policy uh, safety platform. Well, I think my uh, federal platform would be very similar to my state platform. I'm happy to have been a co-sponsor on SB2, uh, which was a major lift, as well as uh, the bill carried by Assemblymember Shirley Weber before um, about um, unnecessary use of force. Uh, you know, as you all know, criminal legal reform is something that I care very deeply about. It's why I 
work to fight for AB 1950, which was probation reform and 333, which was our gang enhancements bill. And having that once again incorporated into the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act that I would carry forward if it doesn't work here. You know, there are so many things that we can fix at the federal level. There are 4,800 restrictions currently now on the books that prevent folks who have been incarcerated from moving ahead when they are dealing with reentry. We have prisons across this country where wardens are raping inmates on a daily basis. And we need to force audits on these institutions so that we can bring some humanity back to the carceral system. At the state level, at my, I'm working on a bill right now on gate money allowance to increase it so that you do not leave prison with only $200 in your pocket, which is not enough to help you successfully reenter. We need to be having that policy discussion at the national level. We don't need more cops. I don't necessarily know if we need less. I haven't studied that nationally, but what we certainly need is better. We need a federal registry, a national public registry where bad police officers can be put in a dashboard for all to see. We also need to deal with the fact that many of our pregnant women who are still in our federal prisons are still being shackled when it is time for them to give birth. But ultimately, what we have to do is reimagine public safety in a way where the people who are supposed to be protected from the police do not feel like they are prey. We're going to call a lot of time on you there. Um, and yeah, it's, um, uh, it is an issue that strikes on, on so many levels. I actually read a piece that you published uh, uh, in, I think it was the conversation about the challenge of having to call the police on a black man. And it was a very well-written piece. I really thought it, it said a lot about what you just reflected on. And um, thanks for, for uh, all of that. So uh, our next policy question um, is gonna be on climate, which we've all agreed in previous statements ties together every other policy issue that we're all discussing here. So uh, a co-chair from IPCC was recently quoted in The Guardian as saying, Scientific evidence is unequivocal. Climate change is a threat to human well-being and the health of the planet. Any further delay in concerted global action will make a brief and rapidly closing window to secure will and will miss a brief and rapidly closing window to secure a livable future. What are the most important policies that Congress can pursue to address climate change, and how will you advance them? So we're going to start with Jan. Um, Again, I take draw, I draw on my experience at the local level and translate that into uh, federal impact because most of what I did was federally funded. Um, you got we have to cool down our communities first of all, uh, especially in communities that are left behind because there tends to be less trees. Uh, the canopy, the tree canopy, is diminished. More more concrete and cement and aging infrastructure. So to be able to uh, quickly and rapidly improve the tree canopy. Um, to be able to quickly and rapidly um, go beyond the 25 foot barrier for the, for example, for like the Inglewood oil field and work towards uh, a, a strategy of buying out those remaining leases and shutting those oil wells down. I was always amazed at how accommodating people are to be able to tolerate that. And we have the largest oil field west of the Mississippi. Uh, but we're not, we're not the only uh, uh, city or county that has that situation. So to be able to do that, um, uh, to ramp up our infrastructure for, for hybrid and electric cars throughout the county, not just in the 37th Congressional District, but to be able to provide more opportunity uh, for people to uh, stop their, lessen their reliance and stop their reliance on fossil fuels. Uh, and then in post-COVID recovery, um, to be able to give people the confidence and the COVID protection to be able to get back on our public transportation. Again, getting more cars off the street, building this project I referred to in Long Beach to get the trucks off the 710 and to be able to clean the air uh, in the Southern part of our county and to upskill the workers there so that they are not displaced and continue to continue to be able to work in clean energy jobs. So there needs to be continuous training in that so that people do not fear it, but embrace it. Thank you. Um, our next, uh, I'm sorry, uh, climate change, uh, same question over to, uh, Sydney. Thank you for that. Um, and it, yes, I 
is an existential issue and the, the number one issue facing us now. I think we need to go back to build back better. Maybe we call it something else, but we need to put the Green New Deal back into it. I'm appalled that Joe Manchin says build back what, um, as if none of it really is important, but of course he gets money from the coal industry, so why not? You know, I got money last year for my urban farming initiative. Uh, I want to be part of the discussions around climate with this farm bill that will come up next year. I think we need to be having deeper discussions about how to fund and create infrastructure for how we recycle and conserve water. You know, $42 billion is coming to California out of the infrastructure Plan and it will be focused on three things, broadband, transportation, and water. And we need to make sure that all of those things, each of those issues are, are, are uh, sort of funded using a climate lens. We should be having national discussions about offshore wind. We should be having national discussions around energy storage and making sure that our grid is resilient across this country. We should be weaning off of oil and consumption and plastic. Like I said, I know we all love our smartphones, but that's part of the problem too. And we should be making sure that all of our agencies across the federal government are focused on climate. Um, you know, FEMA has money that's coming to California that's going to expire at the end of the spring as it relates to fuel mitigation. We should be digging deeper with FEMA and telling them to continue this. Lastly, we should be looking at federal government, making our fleets all electric vehicles. You know, the Department of Defense is actually the largest emitter of nasty emissions. So there are things that actually federal agencies can do to also be part of the solution that we're trying to address with climate and not just consumers. We're gonna call time on you there. Thank you so much. Uh, Daniel, finishing out our climate change question. So for, thank you for that. So for the first part, of course, we need to pass the Green New Deal, but we need to be very upfront with people about what the Green New Deal is. Uh, for me, that's converting to 100% renewable energy by 2030 or 2035. As many of you know, Culver City is part of the Clean Power Alliance and a prior council uh, made that decision, but we've been operating at default 100% renewable for quite a few years. I believe that community choice aggregations, which the Clean Power Alliance is, is a way to get more municipalities and other smaller governmental entities to that place faster. We need the federal government to get there by 2030. Another thing that we need to do is to institute a carbon tax cap and trade does not work. Cap and trade is uh, pretty much a green light to continue polluting for a, a lot of the largest industries. We need to get rid of that. We also need to get rid of fossil fuel subsidies. Uh, if we want to make sure that clean energy is the future, then we should stop subsidizing some of the most profitable co companies in the history of the world. Uh, and we need to subsidize green energy to a more significant extent. In addition, uh, we need to look at the other things that uh, come into play, like housing, like healthcare. Uh, if we have better healthcare, if we have better housing, if we have more dense housing where people do not have to travel large distances to get to work or to get to home or to visit friends, uh, then we lower greenhouse gas emissions. Um, generally, we need to ask more of our federal government uh, and we need to treat this like the New Deal. I think that's the part that's been left out of the conversation around the Green New Deal. This is a Herculean effort and we need to treat it as, as such. We're, yeah, we're going to call time on you there. Um, yeah, it's a, a conversation that I've heard over and over again. And people, you know, one of the things that we don't reflect on, I think, often enough is when FDR did the New Deal, he had a huge majority in Congress. He had an enormous amount of support. It wasn't this razor squeak of, you know, maybe we've got those two recalcitrant votes or maybe we don't. So um, hopefully things will be better in November. But um, yeah, getting uh, getting enough people to uh uh, connect there. I also go back to um, uh, the old quote from John Muir, you know, if you tug on anything, you find out pretty quickly, it's it's tied to everything else. And uh, this is what I'm hearing uh, in, in many, many well thought out answers from all the candidates. And thank you for your, your insights. Uh, question number six is our uh, second to last policy question. And uh, this is about campaign finance. 
So what campaign finance reform measures do you support? And are there types of funding that you do not accept? So we're gonna start with a city. Well, Citizens United is out of control. Um, and I think that's paved the way for a lot of insidious um, efforts that we've now had to sort of fight against in the federal government and at the national level. I do think we need major campaign finance reform. I mean, the reality is, is that, you know, most of the folks who are living and working, probably working more than one job, probably involved in some side hustles, certainly struggling to make ends meet, don't make the kind of money that the 1% makes. Um, you know, I was reading the other day um, that there are 35 million uh, businesses in the United States, um, and 99 percent of them are small businesses. Just one percent are big business, but that big business controls everything. That big business industry controls everything, and that's the problem. When you can afford to um, control the system, you end up where we are now, asking folks that you know to to make choices that they shouldn't have to make about how they live, about how they take care of their families, and about how they plan for their future. I think we need to get big money out of politics. I think we need to shine the light on all kinds of dark money, and I think we need to call um, those industries out. Um, it's certainly we're seeing it happen here at the state level with the state party and resolutions that are coming forward. And I think we have to do more because the reality is as long as the 1% has power, everyone else suffers. We're seeing it in a different way happening in Russia and the Ukraine, right? With an autocrat who is being controlled using a small elite. Um, I don't take money from oil. I don't take money from law enforcement. I don't take money from tobacco. I don't take money from many developers. I am very specific and very thoughtful about who I accept money for, um, but I'm certainly not beholden to anyone. Thank you. Uh, same question over to Daniel. So anyone who's uh, interacted with me for the last decade knows that uh, for the last 10 years, I've been on the board of Move to Amend. Uh, we sponsored HJR 48. Our lead sponsor is Pramila Jayapal's the We the People Amendment calling for an amendment to the Constitution around Citizens United, but also um, Buck Leo from 1976, which said money equals speech and also uh, Southern Pacific Railroad versus Santa, Santa Clara County from, versus uh, 1886. Uh, all of these cases combined to say Citizens United wasn't the start. Uh, we've had a money in politics problem for a very, very long time. Uh, I, like the state senator, do not accept money from uh, real estate backs, tobacco, uh, uh, fossil fuel companies, prison guard companies, police unions. Unlike the senator, I also don't accept money from health insurance companies or health lobbies. I think that is a pretty large distinction to make because I do believe that we need to bring single payer health care to this country. And I think if we elect people who take money from health insurance companies, we're not going to get there. Uh, if we really want to move forward, one, we need an amendment to the Constitution around Citizens United, but we need to go further and we need to have a public financing system which sets a limit of the amount of money that you can use in a campaign and also sets a limit for the campaign itself, for the duration of the campaign and uh, other measures that we can collaboratively agree on. Uh, but we need to be honest about the money that we take and the money that we will deny. Thank you. So finally, um... Uh, Ms. Perry on campaign finance. Thank you very much. Um, as one who was a graduate and came up to the system of the city of Los Angeles on campaign finance and was an early adopter of uh, matching funds, and I know that at the federal level, there is a proposal that is pending for a six to one match. I would strongly support that. Matching funds, publicly financed campaigns, level the playing field uh, for candidates who cannot self-finance or candidates who uh, do not have access to special interest money or third house money or lobbyist money. Um, the real danger and the danger that 
what we need to confront is here at the local level, it is called independent expenditures, or at the federal level, you call it the dark money, because that's where all the third house money goes. And the additional danger is transferring money between jurisdictions, say city to county or state to county or any of those to federal. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, at, the, at the state, you can stockpile your money and then you can ask your donors if you're running for federal office to flip those checks, send them back and say, hey, would you give me back a personal check? Because at the federal level, you can only take personal money. But if you have people who've already given you money and it's sitting there in an account because, you know, you can bank that, uh, you have that stable there waiting to be flipped. Now, what I liked about the city of Los Angeles is that they did not permit that. You had to basically go out and get your own money. But the, the downside is, again, is independent expenditures, third house money, because lawyers will argue that that is your right to free speech, to exercise your right to free speech and to do it through the framework of the independent expenditure or dark money is where, where the real danger lies. We can get public matching funds to create publicly financed campaigns. But again, it's the dark money, the independent expenditures, third house money investing into a candidate. That is the real danger. Thank you. It's, um, you know, as we all see the headlines with these oligarchs and, you know, where the money is going and how fast all this is turning on the international stage, it'll be interesting to see how that changes actual financing uh, coming into the November election on a national level, because um, no doubt a lot of that dark money is uh, coming from, uh, coming from those uh, bad actors. So um, our last question on policy is about health care. And our question is, do you support single payer health care? If so, what is the path to enacting this type of legislation? If not, what do you believe are the problems with the health care system in the US? And what is to be done to address those problems? So uh, we're going to start with uh, Mr. Lee. Dr. Lee, sorry. Uh, thank, thank you for that, Judith. Uh, I proudly support single payer health care. My brother and sister-in-law are doctors um, and I've done well for themselves, but they also support single payer health care. My mom, my aunt, my other aunt, my other aunt, my other aunt and my uh, grandmother were nurses as well. And they support single payer health care. It's what we need to do uh, in order to actually have a healthy and vibrant uh, country uh, that focuses on preventative health care rather than on the symptoms. The symptoms are what lead us into numerous prescriptions. Uh, what I would do and what I think the entire country needs to do to pass single payer health care is what we need to do on many other issues is we don't just need to speak to the people who already agree with us to some degree. And to some degree, that's a large proportion of Democrats and it's an even larger proportion of non-party preference voters. What we need to do is we need to talk to our Republican and or conservative uh, electorate and tell them how this policy in particular would benefit them. We agree to some degree. Some of us are, you know, really stuck in this insurance um, mindset, but we've benefited when we've traveled to the UK. We've benefited when we travel to, uh, you know, Brazil, Australia, uh, other places around the world, uh, and we've had an accident and have found care without uh, a huge outlay of money, care that helps us recover. Um, that should be the norm for whatever type of injury or ailment we go through. Uh, many other countries uh, that are far behind us when it comes to economics have had single payer health care for 50, 60, 70 years. Uh, if, America, if America is so exceptional, uh, we can bring it to our country now. Uh, and thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, the LA Times did a piece a couple of years ago about a guy who had uh, had a cardiac event in France when he was on vacation. And his whole tale of how all that unfolded was really, really good. Los Angeles Times, it's out there. Um, so our next um, question goes to uh, Ms. Perry. Uh, do you support single payer health care, et cetera? Yeah, I do support single payer health care. And we, we, we have a pathway there. We've made some progress, but I think one of the major major points I'd like to make is that eventually everybody has a catastrophic illness in their life, in their family, and people they care for. And I mentioned it earlier. 
taking care of younger people. That's where the preventative health care comes, comes into play. And even as you age, and then also dealing with it on the other end of the spectrum with aging, aging issues, and catastrophic issues. Um, and so, you know, we need to create this national standard of care, the de minimis standard, the standard that everybody can come to expect um, to, 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 to create that equal access. I think in the past, uh, the sticking point has been the issue of a private option so that people don't feel that they're boxed in. And I think if we can deal with that issue so that people will not feel that they're being um, forced, that may eliminate a lot of the opposition and then we can take care of the rest of the country. Um, and then those who want to have that private option, they can go on and have that private option. But we still have 98, 99% of the people that we have to take care of and provide them with the, that basic standard of care so that we can move forward, so that we can actually garner the votes, garner the votes to be able to get this passed and adopted. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sydney. Well, the short answer is yes. I was a proud co-author of AB 1400 throughout its entire journey. And it was unfortunate that it didn't come up for a vote on the assembly floor. I think economics is everything. And we have to talk about economics when we are talking about healthcare. I was thinking about, and I also wanna give a plug out for unions that work really hard to make sure that their members have really great benefits. I was talking to a friend of mine, Galen, who was at the pharmacy, you know, getting his pharmaceuticals. And he said, you know, I have a $2 copay. Um, and if it weren't for my union, I don't know if I would be able to afford to be sick and to get help. So we need to nationalize that discussion everywhere. You know, my federal platform is very similar to my state platform. I ran AB 369, which is about street medicine. The re one of the reasons why it was vetoed is because it would have been incompatible with the regulations in Medicaid. And so we couldn't afford to be out of compliance. So we need to make sure that that doesn't happen nationally so that providers and states across this country can begin to have laws like that. We need to have drug importation from other countries. I had a bill, I have a bill that will allow us to do that from Canada. Florida, if you can believe it, Crazy DeSantis is thinking about doing that. We also need to let the VA and Medicaid and Medicare negotiate their own prices as it relates to pharmaceuticals. The, the medic, Medicaid actually and the VA are the largest purchasers of pharmaceutical drugs. There is why there is a chokehold on this country from big pharma. I did another bill that would say you would take hedge fund managers out of healthcare because now you can actually be denied healthcare for non-medical reasons. There are so many ways that we can work to redesign this system so that that it benefits everyone, regardless of your race, regardless of your age, regardless of your gender. Thank you. So those were the policy questions. And now that we have your thoughts on uh, uh, what you'd like to see happen when you're in Congress, how it should go, where you're, where you're thinking about taking that, um, we're gonna go into uh, some other questions. And these are, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Jeff, we're doing a minute each here. Yeah, one minute each. Okay, so slightly shorter formats. Um, hopefully, uh, uh, I, you're, you're all brilliantly articulate and can get it all in a minute rather than two. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, so short answer uh, number one, um, who did you support in the 2020 primary? Uh, Ms. Perry. 2020 primary for the president? Yeah. That's Jeff is shaking his head at me. Yes, the 2020 presidential primary. Sorry, my notes just say primary. Well, Biden Harris. There you go. Okay. That's that well under. Do I need to say more? <laughs> no, I don't think I think I mean, you're, we're, you're we're good. in a democratic we got you. meeting. Tennis match there. And good and, and pick some good odds. Yeah, we like that. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, no, I did. Yes. Uh, Ms. Ms. Kamlogger, who did you support in the 2020 presidential primary? Uh ultimately I supported Biden Harris. Excellent. And Mr. Lee, Dr. Lee, sorry, I keep taking away your doctorate. Daniel. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you for that. I believe that the reason that this question is in here is because Senator Kamwagar initially supported uh, 
Michael Bloomberg and then supported President Biden, but I have supported Bernie Sanders, and that is who I supported in that primary and in the 2016 primary. Okay, then everybody's. So, is there a way to just add a little context, given I only used a few seconds and someone talked about me? You know, I'm I'm gonna say uh, yes. Uh, we'll okay, give you great. we'll give you 30 seconds for a rebuttal. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> so, I want to say that Oklahoma was actually the first state to outlaw teaching something that would make you feel uncomfortable, i.e., critical race theory. It was also the state where the Tulsa massacre happened and Black Wall Street was burned down. I will say that Michael Bloomberg was the only person, has been the only person to inject that back into the national consciousness and put together the Greenwood Institute, which was about reparations that would fund $350 million to go back into black communities. That was why I initially supported him because I am super, super committed to making sure that black issues remain front and center in all of our discussions around economic justice. And sometimes and did you talk to him about stop better. and frisk. Uh, did you talk to him about stop and frisk, or was that the right, well, Daniel? Daniel we're, we're, I don't want to get into then. We're, then we're going into a debate format, and that's a whole. Other I, I got it, but she had a, an opportunity to respond, so I'm responding. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna call that question there, and we're done. Um, question uh, number two. Um, who did you support in the 2020 Culver City Council race? If you did not support any candidates, why not? Um, 2020 Culver City Council race to uh, Sydney. The I can't really remember who ran in 2020. Yeah, it's a very- That seems Culver like City almost a lifetime question. ago. <laughs> so who was well, on the ballot in Culver City then in 2020? Uh, we had um, uh, uh, Yasmin McMorin was our top vote getter. She is now on council. Uh, Albert Vera Jr. was the second place. He is now on council. Uh, Yoran Erickson uh, also reran successfully for his seat. Uh, those were our three uh, council winners. Uh, right behind that, we had Freddie Puza, who is now coming for his second run uh, at the office. After that was Daryl Menthe. Um, and... Farther down ballot, we had uh, Heather Wolin, and um, oh, I'm an old lady and I'm missing the last <laughs> candidate. I'm sorry, there's one just, just out of my reach. Somebody grab a note and hold up a sign or tell me. Jeff, uh, we Robert Zergoulis. I'm sorry? Uh, Robert Zergoulis. Oh, oh, of course. Yeah, see, he's a non-player character in my game, so mm -hmm. I forget him all the time. Um, He's uh he's kind of our constant candidate. He runs for everything. So I just sort of I just sort of blocked him out. Yeah. Um so um yes, yeah, so those were our top our 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 2020 uh city council race. Um I'm I'm again I I'm I i do not know since people didn't vote in our Culver City primary or in our Culver City Council race, unless they're Culver City residents, I uh, it's it's an interesting question, but I didn't, we'll run with it. Let's, let's go ahead and say, if you, if we can remember all the way back to 2020, uh, which was several centuries ago, but. Um, well, I certainly, I didn't vote for any of them because I don't live in Culver City and I yeah. believe um, I supported, I endorsed some folks who are running for Culver City School Board, but I don't know if I offered a formal endorse, endorsement for anyone who was running in 2020. I thought it was important to let um, the community decide. Culver City is an incredibly vocal city. We are, thank you. <laughs> All right, we'll say a uh, question over to um, uh, Daniel. I support Yasmin Money McMoran and Freddie Puzo. Okay. Ms. Perry, did you have candidates that you were supporting in the Culver City 2020 council race? Was that outside of your radar? Well, I live in the unincorporated area uh, of uh, the county, uh, Ladera, so I couldn't vote, but you know, I have had interactions uh, with a number of the council members over the years, and I do know Yorin Erickson, I know Albert Vera, I don't know Daniel very well, but I have seen him around uh, you know, over the last couple of years, but I don't really know him all that well. But I was able to work with Culver City uh, over the years on the expo line. And so, you know, I've always had my, my foot uh, and hopefully my brain 
uh, in the issues that affect us across the region. And Culver City is a very dynamic community of uh, outspoken advocates. Thank you. Yeah, it's uh, I, because I, I Culver City Crossroads covers local news. I would yeah. say we have these very strange borders around the city, so yeah. it makes some things a little erratic. And yeah. here we are in a you know a congressional conversation, which is a much bigger space. Right. And so uh, you know I respect people having their thoughts um, in regard to our, our. We like to say we're we're an island surrounded entirely by Los Angeles. So uh, we we got to know that what Los Angeles does matters to us. What what we not, might not make the same uh, the same type on the headline. So. Um, Kind of a more um, open question, uh, short answer number three, uh, what are you reading? One of my favorite questions, what are you reading? And uh, tell us about it. Uh, we'll start with Daniel. So I'm aggressively trying to finish uh, a book called The Franchise, uh, would it, which is written by a friend of mine, Marsha uh, Chatelon. She's a Haitian immigrant uh, and a professor at Georgetown University in DC. Uh, but it's about the interaction between the McDonald's organization uh, and the civil rights movement, the black community in particular. Um, there's a lot that we hear about Woolworths and other places, but we don't hear as much about McDonald's. And it's always been uh, thought of since I grew up as a conducive place uh, for uh, Black thought and civil rights organizing, but it had a pretty dark period where it was completely uh, pro-segregationalist. Uh, and there were a lot of different changes that happened in that context. Marsha is a brilliant person. Uh, I have about 100 pages left. Uh, I need to finish it before I see her again. Well, I'd say we'll let you, we'll let you get back to it very shortly. So it sounds like a great book, though. I've got to pick it up. So um, Ms. And she Jerry, also won a Pulitzer Prize for it uh, last year. Well, that that always helps your boost your sales. That will get you some readers when you when you uh, have that nice sticker on your book. Um, and, and you know, it's uh, there's a McDonald's uh, everywhere you look, so it's something that should probably be more uh, more required reading on uh, uh, the national uh, uh, consciousness. Uh, Ms. Perry, what are you reading? And tell us about it. All right. Well, I read. I read constantly. I love reading newspapers, and I like reading the hard copy, not just online. But the book that I'm reading right now is Israel. Uh, the author is Noah Tishby. Um, I need to deepen my understanding of uh, the historical basis for conflicts in the Middle East, number one. Number two, integrate my own experience with workforce development, dealing with left behind communities uh, as a social justice chair in a group called Black Women for Positive Change, where we've worked for 10 years on the de-escalation of violence and the elements that are almost universal no matter where you are, what you bring to a community to de-escalate conflict, to de-escalate violence and hatred. Um, so this book is helping me develop a better framework for you know, filtering my assumptions and my assertions and my own experiences on a much broader stage because as a congressperson, we will be called upon to perhaps put people's lives at risk. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm gonna call time on you there, that was a minute, but it sounds like a very, very good book. I'd be- yeah, Here it is, right here, right there. There you go. <laughs> Okay. There you cover. Go. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's a nice cover. Okay. But wait, we've got we, you. You've got the soft background on, so we're just. I know. Blurry, I know that. That's, I gotta keep that's it okay. Soft. We'll uh, we'll catch the title and we'll we'll boost it in the we'll boost it in the notes. Okay. So, um, Sydney, what are you reading? Tell us about it. Well, I'm reading a book again on Frederick Douglass. Um, in my office, I have a number of um portraits of him, and so uh, very important uh, to the history of Black America. And I'm also reading a book by a friend of mine called The Algorithms of Oppression, which is about privacy. It's about algorithms that are used to capture all of our data and turn us into essentially, you know, data chips uh, and information, and ultimately to steer us uh, to things that are not healthy and are not sustainable. I think we need to get a better, better handle nationally on cybersecurity and also the outreach that the internet has um, you know, into our lives and into our homes. It's one of the reasons why there's been an uptick in so much depression and suicides from girls uh, and boys across this country. Thank you. Yeah, really good book. So 
Um, just to toss in, uh, I'm reading the novel, uh, The Sentence by Louise Erdrich. And it's a terrific, she's a wonderful uh, novelist that really focuses on the Native American experience. Uh, and this is written during, it's like in the pandemic. So she is in Minneapolis during the pandemic. She's talking about working in a bookstore and the bookstore closing and the George Floyd uprising and all of that. So it's super contemporary. I can't believe it's like a hardcover that I got, you know, off the shelf. It's really that. Uh, no, no, she's great. I read tracks when I was in high school by Louise Erdrich as well. Yeah, yeah, she's a terrific writer. So thank you. It's uh, it's nice to, to know what you're reading and get that insight on what's, uh, what's on your desk. So uh, short answer number four, and this is all, all the way out into our fluffy side, or at least it's, you know, creative economy. We're very concerned in uh, Culver City. Uh, which film do you think will win the Best Picture Oscar? And which film do you think should win the Best Picture Oscar? So we're going to start with Jan. You know, I haven't been to a film in so long <laughs> that I'm not even sure. I saw West Side Story uh, and I loved the remake of it. And I really love the fact that they integrated Rita Moreno in that she married Doc and was still mm. running the drugstore. Uh, the other thing that I liked about that is that they showed the impact of poverty and violence and you know, urban renewal and the flaws of urban renewal at that time, which was just to displace people and push them out, but not provide them with anything else. So actually, I, so I saw that movie, I have to say that, but I spent a lot of time you know, watching television with my millennial and her friends. And, uh, you know, so I'm really kind of interested in euphoria <laughs> and what that all means. That's, you know? That would be an Emmy, but we'll-, we'll, we'll No, we'll, I know it's an Emmy, and uh, I, yeah, yeah. but yeah. So anyway, I'll go with West Side Story for now. A lot of breakout stars there. Uh, uh, Miss DeBose was ex incredible uh, as Anita. And uh, it was, it was, they were real people. They were real people of color. Uh, with real, real language. Uh, and Rita Moreno was the uh, producer. Or I think she was an executive producer. Executive producer, yeah, she was. Yeah, so it, that movie had a lot of authenticity. Great. Well, we, we don't get you, a, we don't get to give you an Academy ballot, but we'll, we'll note your choices. So uh, okay, thank you. we'll thank take you. it over. Uh, Sydney, what do, you, what do you think will win? What do you think should win? I don't have a crystal ball, but I think uh, people really like Jane Champion. And so Power of the Dog uh, got a lot of critical uh, fame early on. Um, Coda, I think, is picking up steam. And there's a great story connected to it because uh, many of the actors in the movie um, are deaf. And I 100% support that. Um, I think Encanto should win. And I don't even know if it's nominated, but I'll say that I have talked to so many people who are saying with kids and without, they're like, oh my God, Encanto with the songs. Oh my God, Encanto. So for the cheap seats in the back, we should be uh, having an animated film earn best picture. There you go. I saw a really funny uh, uh, tweet about someone was uh, discussing uh, the State of the Union address they said, we also must notice what was not discussed. We did not talk about Bruno. So I thought that was- <laughs> Oh my goodness. Wow. I'm a big fan. <laughs> so uh, uh, Mayor Lee, tell us, uh, what do you think will win? What do you think should win? Best picture. Uh, I think Dune will probably win. Uh, just as someone who's actually read the book, I gotta say I was a little disappointed because it seemed like it was like one third of the book. Uh, and nothing happened for a very long time, even though it looked pretty. Uh, the only movies I saw were Nightmare Alley, Dune, and Don't Look Up. Uh, I haven't seen King Richard. Uh, to some degree, I think it might have some pedigree. I feel like Will Smith since Six Degrees of Separation has been underrated as an actor. Uh, but from a policy perspective, I believe Don't Look Up should win. Uh, it really uh, captures our current moment when it comes to climate policy, when it comes to things that we've known. And I've spoken to this uh, about this to people that I went to elementary school with and middle school with who, you know, like me, grew up thinking climate change was real. Um, that's we're, it. For we're going to call time on you there. But, you know, it's a it's a time honored truth. The book is always better than the movie. 
And if you read Frank Herbert, I mean, you know, yeah, they got a couple more movies coming behind this. I mean, that was clearly not the not the entire book, but uh, they're gonna they're gonna spin it out as long as they can. So, um, and again, creative economy, you know, is a huge huge factor for us. I mean, it brings in billions of dollars every year, and movies are light and they're fun and they're interesting, but they also reflect, you know, what this is what people talk about. This is what we're thinking about. These are the stories that uh, you know tell us. Uh, who, who we are and what we, we want to see happening. So um, do I have one more question? I think that was it for all of our formal questions. So we're going to roll right over into closing statements and everyone has three minutes to close. Yes, Jeff, three minutes. Okay, same as your opening statement. So we will start with uh, Ms. Perry, if you would close out for us this evening. Before I start the clock, once I'm done, is it all right if I depart? Yes, I think our format is after that. Once you finish your closing statement, um, they're going to um, uh, finish the meeting. Again, the actual voting for endorsements will not take yeah. place on this thank call. You. So, yes, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And it's been a real honor to talk to all of you tonight. And I think we share many of the same progressive values. I've dedicated my entire life to pursuing those values. The focus of my public service has been dedicated to that. Three terms on the city council, I told you about the amount of housing I built. I'm not gonna to go to Washington to be part of a club and I'm not anointed by a political machine. I'm going on your behalf, on behalf of the people that I'm fighting very hard to represent and to bring meaningful resources back to our district where they're needed the most. Of course, we need new ideas. Of course, we need brilliant strategies, but what we really need are politicians who are gonna keep their word and do what they say and say what they mean. Everybody on this Zoom knows what needs to be done. So the question is, is what in the hell are we waiting for? If we don't get universal health care, then I'm going to say we can't, we're not going to raise the debt ceiling. If we don't get voting rights, uh, we're not going to increase the defense budget. And if our teachers can't pay rent, there's going to be hell to pay for all of us. We have to take care of them. I'm not going to bridges. I'm there to disassemble those bridges if we can't get what we need for our people. So I'm here to tell you we've been far too nice for too long. Um, I'll take the fight to Washington. I have no intention of bargaining or negotiating with extremists or white supremacists. We have to face the truth about that. We are at war with our neighbors and ignorance is their ally. The stark reality of the previous president is that the spread of evil that is permeating our society now is relentless. The old rules do not apply. The days of compromise are probably out the window. We can't say, okay, next time we're gonna get it passed. Reason is lost and facts no longer matter. So you know what, if you want, if you want the unity and reconciliation uh, program, you're probably not gonna vote for me. The things that divide us are greater than the things that unite us. We need to flip that. We need to flip that. So I'm here to say we will achieve peace when our rights are protected, all of our rights, our voting rights, our right to housing, our right to health care, our right to public safety to be safe within our own communities and our personal safety. There can't be any negotiation. Enough is enough. Thank you very much for having me. And I've enjoyed myself enormously. Take care. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. We really Thanks. appreciate you being here. Thank you. And as often happens, there are other Zoom calls waiting for us on other channels that people must attend to. So our next closing statement will be Sydney. Thank you. And how did I know it would be me? I want to thank everyone for the opportunity to see you all uh, here tonight. You know, we live in a bubble here in California, and we think that everything that happens here happens everywhere else. And it doesn't. You know, bad policy is spreading like a cancer across all of these states, and the cure really is national policy. We see that our democracy is fragile here and abroad, and we have to work to fight against voter suppression. We have to work to pass the Electoral Count Act. We have to work to make sure that we are protecting a woman's right to choose and to have autonomy over her body. You know, reproductive health care is not just about your ability to decide if you want to have sex or not or have a child or not. It's also inextricably linked to poverty. 
and for women to be able to make decisions about how they want to live their lives, how they want to care for their children, and to be able to do that while being able to have their family's needs met. Globalization sounded fun years ago, but it has become increasingly scary with issues like cybersecurity, with what's happening in um, Eastern Europe right now between Russia and the Ukraine. And while it is great that it has temporarily brought the West together, we have serious things that we have to discuss as it relates to what's going on. Everything from our over addiction to oil uh, to what the supply chain breakdown really means for us and this country and our union workers and for how we're going to move into a future that is here and available and affordable for everyone. You know, my I'm also running to protect our seniors and our most vulnerable and our youth. And we have seen so many cracks in our safety net systems impacting those particular demographics and populations become because of COVID. And so now that this has turned into an endemic, how do we make sure that we are investing across this country to make sure that we are prepared for the next thing that hits us because something else will hit us soon. I think people are exhausted. They are tired of government seeming to be the problem and not a problem solver. That is why I am running to represent this district. I have found ways to be a consensus builder. I have found ways to build coalitions. And I've also found ways and the time to tell it like it is and keep it real and throw a grenade or two when that needs to happen. Ultimately, I am running because I want to make this district and our country safer, healthy, and more affordable. And I want to bring folks from the margins to the center. Thank you. Thank you. And our closing, closing, Daniel. Uh, thank you, Judith. Three minutes, yeah. um, I'll, I'll, I'll start by just saying, I think a lot of us know um, that the electorate in California on the local level, the state level, and the federal level is actually further to the left than our elected officials. Our electorate is very much in favor of single payer health care. Our elected is very our electorate is very much in favor of uh, 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 constitutional reform when it comes to Citizens United and publicly funded elections. Our electorate is in favor of enshrining a woman or a person's right to choose and law. Our politicians need to catch up. Our politicians not only need to catch up, but they need to go much, much further. Uh, when this question first came up because of the phrasing, I initially thought about the Chambers brothers and their song, The Time Has Come Today. Uh, it was a while before I realized that was, you know, primarily African American rock band uh, from the 60s uh, with a fairly iconic song that uh, not a whole lot of African American people know, not a whole lot of white people know either. Uh, but the time has come. Uh, we don't have a lot of time. The IPCC report, which I had hoped would be something that I would be compelled to talk about in multiple interviews this week, has not come up. It is not, even as those interviews still say that the context of climate change is will change every other issue that we're talking about. It is the most important thing. It is the most important thing because, because it affects first people of color, first working class people, and first women. The people who move our society forward, who keep us going, the people who we need to support going forward. It's one of the reasons that I support, of course, the PRO Act to end right to work nationally. Uh, is one of the reasons I support strengthening and protecting voting rights. It's one of the reasons I support single payer healthcare in the context of Medicare for all or any other type of conflagration uh, it, combination. It's one of the reasons that I support uh, the Green New Deal and in fossil fuel subsidies. Uh, and it's, you know, one of the reasons that I support comprehensive immigration reform because it was farm workers who kept us going. It's time for us to recognize what our society is actually built on and the people who actually keep us going and not people who have titles, who tell us because of their title, 
we should respect them and their leadership when they have shown no leadership in the past. It's time for us to do something different and to recognize and address the challenges that we have before us. And thank you. So that is our entire uh, scheduled format for this evening. Um, unless I just say Jeff, Jeff is looking to be like, no, we're not setting up. Uh, that is the end of our of our candidate uh, um, uh, forum. So thank you to uh, uh, Mayor Lee, thank you to uh, Senator Kamlager, and thank you to Ms. Perry for their participation in our program this evening. Um, the club will be uh, voting on endorsements, I believe, at the next meeting, which is which sure. is the next meeting. So uh, whatever I, I believe the, uh... March night. March 9th. Okay, so that's a week from tonight. Yes. Let so me uh, if you're a member of the club, yeah, if you're a member of the club, that's the time to, you know, go through your notes, make sure you're there to uh, uh, sign on the dotted line and get everything organized in correct format. And in the meantime, uh, thank you so much once again for inviting me to be part of your evening. And um, the website is ccdc.com, the Culver City Democratic Club.com. And um, uh, that is the place to check in for more information. So um, great, great job, Judith. Terrific. Oh, thank Thanks you so much. All, all compliments cheerfully accepted free of charge. Great so job. I'm signing off and I will hand you back over to uh, Jeff Schwartz uh, for whatever, whatever else needs to happen this evening. Great. And um, I'm going to stop the recording. Thank you very much. Okay. Great job.